Or when the president does it, that means that it is not illegal. It's a thing called Article 2. Nobody ever mentions Article 2. More importantly, Article 2 allows me to do whatever I want. Our common theme is to take down the administrative state, the bureaucracy, preparing to march into office and bring a new army of aligned, trained, and essentially weaponized conservatives ready to do battle against the deep state. For the last 18 months, conservatives from every corner of the far-right establishment, from extremist think tanks to former members of the Trump administration to tenured academics, have been working both publicly and privately on a new project. The project's goal? To rescue the country from the grip of the radical left, uniting the conservative movement in the American people against elite rule and woke culture warriors. And the stakes are high. According According to this group, if we fail, the fight for the very idea of America may be lost. Last month, this group of far-right leaders known as Project 2025 released a 920-page manifesto titled Mandate for Leadership, The Conservative Promise. In it, the document's 35 different named authors, united and copyrighted by the Far-Right Heritage Foundation, lay out an explicit, comprehensive plan to completely overhaul the U.S. government from the inside out, with the ultimate goal of furthering far-right wedge issues and concentrating as much power as possible in the hands of the president. Project 2025 is touted as the ultimate solution to paving the way for the next conservative administration, which they believe will take power in January 2025. While the entire project mimics the same talking points that Trump has harped on throughout his presidency and current campaign, the leaders of this project make clear that the plan is not dependent on a specific person winning the Republican nomination and ultimately the White House. Instead, it's a blueprint for the next conservative executive whoever they may be, to push the limits of presidential power so far that they will answer to no one, wreaking havoc on the delicate balance of our three branches of government that have allowed us to function as a democracy for nearly two and a half centuries. This is the conservative plan to take over the country. Roll the intro. A lot of you like to assume that lawyers universally are millionaires. And while it's true that there are quite a few millionaire lawyers, many of us are just swimming in cesspools of debt that we had to take on to get these degrees in the first place. So it may come as a shock to learn that I am in fact in so much debt. On top of that law degree, I also have an undergrad degree and a house and I've started a business and I've taken on more credit card debt than I care to admit to. And with rising interest rates and cost of living, that's not a super fun place to be in. I get it. And you, like me, probably wish there was a better solution to pay off your debt. That's where my partner on today's video, PDS Debt, comes in. PDS Debt has customized 0% interest options for anyone struggling with credit cards, personal loans, collections, or medical bills. So stop waiting and sitting on this debt and start saving with your own custom debt saving options from PDS Debt. PDS Debt is giving my viewers a free debt savings analysis just for completing the 30 second online debt assessment at pdsdebt.com. Com slash Miller. You'll receive a full breakdown on how to save on interest each month and the quickest way to take care of your debt. Everyone with over $10,000 in debt qualifies and there's no minimum credit score required. PDS Debt rolls all of your payments into one low 0% interest monthly payment so you can save thousands in interest and fees. If you're making payments every month on your debt but your balances just won't seem to go down, this program is for you. So take advantage of PDS Debt's free debt analysis just for my viewers Go to pdsdebt.com slash Miller to complete the quick and easy debt assessment. That's pdsdebt.com slash Miller. Thanks, PDS Debt. Launched in April 2022, Project 2025 is the brainchild of the far-right think tank, the Heritage Foundation, which deserves its own entire video for all the shady shit that they've been up to over the last 40 plus years. Project 2025 is systematically building the future of the conservative movement and promoting policy objectives that would have devastating consequences not only in our government, but for every person living in this country. That might sound hyperbolic, but I'm telling you, I cover a lot of batshit stories about conservatives, and this one has me spooked as hell, y'all. 
Their plan to further these goals has four pillars. Pillar number one is the policy, embodied in that 920 page manifesto they dropped last month. Pillar number two is the personnel database, described as the conservative LinkedIn. The objective of the database is to collect resumes and information for thousands and thousands of conservatives from all walks of life and industries in order to source the best candidates to pack every branch and administrative body in Washington and throughout the states. To ensure that this database of personnel and the chosen warriors who will infiltrate the government at every level are properly prepared to represent the conservative goals set forth in the policy, Project 2025 relies on pillar number three, training. Through an online institute, Project 2025 will prepare the foot soldiers of the conservative agenda to push their policies from day one. And because they've been preparing for years, they will be ready on day one of the new conservative presidency, thanks to pillar number four. Pillar number four is the 180 day playbook, the step-by-step -step guide for the next conservative president to implement the policies laid out in the manifesto as quickly and systematically as possible in the first 180 days of their term. Through these four pillars, policy, personnel, training, and the playbook, Project 2025 aims to overhaul the entire US government from the inside out, putting in place draconian policies and gutting important government agencies, all in the name of the constitution and good, white, Christian family values. Let's take each pillar in turn, though we will be spending the bulk of our time on pillar one, the policy, because we have 920 pages to cover, and it is the most fleshed out and horrific part of the plan so far. Project 2025 published their 920 page mandate for leadership policy manifesto as a free PDF on their website. I considered getting a physical copy to be able to wave around for you just to see what it looks like printed, but that would require me to give $35 to the Heritage Foundation, so digital will do. That being said, I did not unfortunately read 920 pages of this thing, though I don't think it's a bad idea to do so. I did, however, read the first 50 pages of the PDF, including the list of organizers, authors, the introductory note, and the foreword to get a good flavor of what's going on. And frankly, entire books could be and have been written on some of the batshit theories and doctrines they rely on just in the introduction alone. So we have plenty to dig into. Plus the work of journalists who have poured over the manifesto at length will help us in our dizzying tour of the policies laid out in this manifesto. So let's get into it. The policy book is divided into five sections. One, taking the reins of government. Two, the common defense. Three, the general welfare four, the economy, and five, independent regulatory agencies. The note at the beginning of the paper, authored by Project 2025 director Paul Danz, a former Trump official, lays out what's at stake. The long march of cultural Marxism through our institutions has come to pass. The federal government is a behemoth, weaponized against American citizens and conservative values, with freedom and liberty under siege as never before. The task at hand to reverse this tide and restore our republic to its original moorings is too great for any one conservative policy shop to spearhead. It requires the collective action of our movement. With the quickening approach of January 2025, we have two years and one chance to get it right. The language throughout the policy manifesto and the Project 2025 website is militant, clearly meant to play into the fears and the patriotic duty that far-right constituents feel so strongly. The same militant language that led to the righteous anger of the January 6th insurrection. The report starts with, we want you. The 2025 presidential transition project is the conservative movement's unified effort to be ready for the next conservative administration to govern at 12 noon, January 20th, 2025. Welcome to the mission. By opening this book, you are now a part of it. Indeed, one set of eyes reading these pages will be those of the 47th president of the United States. And we hope every other reader will join in making the incoming administration a success. And I know this, like, it's not explicitly about Trump, but listen, we all know that man is not reading a 920 page manifesto in the unlikely chance that he does take the White House in January, 2025. Get real but you get the vibe. This is positioned as a mandate, making readers, ostensibly the conservative foot soldiers who'll do their bidding, feel like they're in on a top secret mission, like this is some G.I. Joe mission shit, because the authors know that that is the absolute conservative wet dream and they're playing into it. The foreword includes a tidy summation of all the conservative wedge issues and talking points that have been flying around over the last few decades, all of which are addressed at length in the document. Look at America under the ruling and cultural elite today. Inflation is ravaging family budgets. Drug overdose deaths continue to escalate and children suffer the toxic normalization of transgenderism with drag queens and pornography invading their school libraries. Overseas, a totalitarian communist dictatorship in Beijing is engaged in a strategic cultural 
cultural and economic cold war against America's interests, values, and people. All while globalist elites in Washington awaken only slowly to that growing threat. Moreover, low-income communities are drowning in addiction and government dependence. Contemporary elites have even repurposed the worst ingredients of 1970s radical chic to build the totalitarian cult known today as the Great Awakening. Most alarming of all, the very moral foundations of our society are in peril. The forward goes on to list the four broad fronts that the policy mandate will cover. Those are, one, restore the family as the centerpiece of American life and protect our children. Two, dismantle the administrative state and return self-governance to the American people. Three, defend our nation's sovereignty, borders, and bounty against global threats. Four, secure our God-given individual rights to live freely, what our constitution calls the blessings of liberty. And the manifesto goes on to lay out over 920 pages in five sections how they plan on furthering those four fronts. Chief among the policies promoted in the manifesto are a gutting of the administrative state and furtherance of the unitary executive theory, which we'll get into what those mean, plus anti-globalist and anti-environmentalist policies to protect from infiltration of Chinese culture into American life and continue the flourishing of American commerce, plus draconian anti-LGBTQ plus policies and a centering of religion and the traditional family unit in every aspect of governance. Yeah, it's bleak. Let's get into it. By far the scariest aspect of the policy, and the one getting the most critical commentary, is the absolutist commitment to gutting the administrative state and concentrating power into the hands of the president. The administrative state is sometimes called the fourth branch of government, and there have been debates for centuries as to whether it's constitutional. You know all those agencies like the EPA, Social Security Agency, HUD, FEMA, the Fed, the Department of Homeland Security? Yeah, all of those, all those governmental bodies that manage the administration of day-to-day -day Operation of the country and promulgate regulations for everything from transportation to healthcare to food to clean water. That's the administrative state. It's not technically in the Constitution, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's not constitutional. And listen, most law students take an admin law class, and I can tell you right now that shit is dry. I barely could keep my eyes open during that class. So I won't bore you with too much detail, but this issue does take on a new and much more important meaning when you learn what Project 2025 wants to do about it. So here's some admin law 101. Admin law governs the structure, decision processes, and behavior of administrative agencies. Those agencies are created by statute, executive order, or by state constitutions. Admin agencies are also referred to as commissions, boards, authorities, bureaus, offices, departments, divisions, etc. They're created by executive order, meaning when the president says so, or by Congress. Say Congress passes a law saying something is illegal. In that same law, they might say, we also create this new agency, and this agency is tasked with overseeing and implementing this law. For example, the Federal Food and Drug Administration was created by the Pure Food and Drugs Act of 1906 to oversee the implementation of that law. The main functions of administrative agencies are to investigate, make rules, and adjudicate. That's why there's administrative law courts. They're not state or federal courts, they're separate, less formal courts where agencies can conduct hearings and enforce the regulations that they write and promote. Those admin law rulings can be appealed up to state and federal courts, but most of the day-to-day -day workings of administrative agencies happen within the agencies and their courts. That doesn't mean, however, that there is zero oversight of these agencies. Like I said, Rulings in the admin law courts can be appealed to state and federal courts. Congress can pass laws like the Administrative Procedure Act to rein in administrative agencies, and Congress also still controls the purse strings. The first federal admin agency was the State Department, created in 1789, when Congress was still chock-a-block full of original framers of the Constitution, I might add, which does back up claims that the administrative bodies are implied in the Constitution. The idea behind creating these agencies, instead of having Congress or the President alone in charge of implementing the laws, because it turns out it takes a lot of work to run a country, and agencies are in charge of creating a lot of regulations. Further, agencies are staffed by subject matter experts, at least in theory. So, for example, the people in the EPA have spent their careers learning about environmental policy and regulation, and are therefore much better positioned to implement a law than the lone president or Congress people. And the Supreme Court has repeatedly upheld the constitutionality of administrative agencies, and tends to give a lot of deference to their decisions 
decisions because they are the subject matter experts. While Congress often creates the agencies, most of them technically fall under the purview of the executive branch, of which the president is the head, because the Constitution vests the power to faithfully execute the laws of the country in the president, in Article 2. Admin agencies do just that. They execute the laws, and they oversee said execution in a way that a single executive couldn't, and also in a way that ensures extensive checks and balances over executive authority. But this is why the president typically appoints heads of all these agencies, because they're technically part of the executive branch. But while the heads of those agencies come and go with the politics of the time, the people operating under them are not tied to politics or a president and tend to make careers out of working in those agencies. This again creates a modicum of separations of powers and ensures that people with subject matter expertise are staffing these agencies. So sure, you can appoint the attorney general as president, but you can't fire all the prosecutors who don't agree with you. I was working at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Boston the day that Jeff Sessions was fired and the jubilation some of those lawyers felt, it was palpable. And they don't have to worry about losing their job because of that or at least not for now. Okay, so this is why administrative law is considered the fourth branch of government. It wields a lot of power. Some would say too much power, which is why Project 2025 is so dead set on gutting administrative bodies. Are we on the same page? Great. You are now more of an expert on admin law than 99% of the US population. The foreword in Project 2025's policy manifesto lays out their objections to the current state of affairs. Congress passes intentionally vague laws that delegate decision-making over a given issue to a federal agent Agency. That agency's bureaucrats, not just unelected but seemingly unfireable, then leap at the chance to fill the vacuum created by Congress's preening cowardice. The federal government is growing larger and less constitutionally accountable, even to the president, every year. Okay, so they're saying there's too many bureaucrats and the president doesn't have enough power. It continues, the conservative promise lays out how to fire supposedly unfireable federal bureaucrats, how to shutter wasteful and corrupt bureaus and offices, how to muzzle woke propaganda at every level of government, how to restore the American people's constitutional authority over the administrative state, and how to save untold taxpayer dollars in the process. So they're basically Ron Swansoning the government, attempting to put people in places of power to dismantle federal agencies from the inside. Except it's not a fun joke about a lovable libertarian with a mustache, it has far-reaching consequences that are made all the more dire when you learn about the unitary executive theory, the theory upon which many of the Project 2025 recommendations rely. Okay, we got admin law, unitary executive theory. We are getting into some deep constitutional law principles today, my friends. And if you want even more of a primer on constitutional law, check out my free two-week email course called Smart Ass Civics. Sign up to receive daily bite-sized morsels of con law delivered straight to your inbox. You'll be beating your racist Uncle Rick at arguments by Thanksgiving. Link in the description. Okay, so unitary executive theory. It's this batshit theory that has only been made up in the last few decades. In fact, we have our good old friend, Ronald fucking Reagan to blame once again for its proliferation, because of course. The theory came to prominence during Reagan, but really put down roots during the presidency of George W. Bush. Basically, the theory rejects the idea of three equal branches of government put in place to ensure a rigorous system of checks and balances so no one branch becomes too powerful. Instead, the unitary executive theory says, actually, inherent in Article II of the Constitution, the president has complete control of the executive branch. So Congress can't create all of these agencies and put power in the hands of agency heads to make decisions. That power is supposed to be concentrated in the hands of the one singular executive. Reagan's lawyers came up with the idea in order to push deregulatory efforts. Bush Jr. used it to lend validity to his exercises of power after 9-11. While Obama expressed a more modest view of presidential power initially, he too exercised authority that circumvented Congress in several policy areas, especially in the deployment of U.S. military forces overseas. And then Trump, of course, came in and was like, hold my Big Mac, let me try this. And he frequently tested the bounds of acceptable exercise of executive power, from Muslim bans to the border to threatening sanctuary cities, he declared over and over that his authority extended to overriding congressional laws and funding authority. As one judge stated in response to Trump's threats against sanctuary cities, the separation of powers acts as a check on tyranny and the concentration of power. If the executive branch can determine policy and then use the power of the purse to mandate compliance with that policy by the state and local governments, all without authorization or even acquiescence of elected legislators, that check against tyranny is forsaken. 
Trump considered himself and his presidential powers not only beyond the bounds of Congress, but even beyond the bounds of judicial review, arguing that his travel ban was unreviewable by the federal courts. The judge in that case declared, there is no precedent to support this claimed unreviewability, which runs contrary to the fundamental structure of our constitutional democracy. Even scholars who are in favor of wide-reaching executive power are appalled at Trump's behavior. John Yoo advocates in favor of the unitary executive theory and famously wrote a memo defending the legality of waterboarding under Bush. But he also wrote a New York Times editorial entitled Executive Power Run Amuck," saying, even I have grave concerns about Mr. Trump's uses of presidential power. Yikes. Yikes. But it appears that Project 2025 is supporting the idea that the president should constitutionally be entitled to vast levels of control over all administrative agencies, what they do, and who runs and staffs them from the top down, and Congress should have no ability to check that executive authority. Many, many constitutional law scholars argue that this is beyond the bounds of the Constitution, no matter how you look at it. But the first administration of Donald Trump, whether or not there's a second, has already done the damage. As Jeffrey Crouch writes in his 2020 book on the unitary executive theory, yes, there are entire books about this, once precedents have been established for presidents to exercise expansive presidential powers with little pushback, future chief executives will be less likely to feel responsible for dialing them back. And Project 2025 is betting on just that, with its expansive overhaul of every administrative agency in the country. If he does get back in the White House, Trump has made clear that he'll finish what he started, declaring he will find and remove the radicals who have infiltrated the Federal Department of Education, and promising to demolish the deep state. We will expel the warmongers from our government. We will drive out the globalists. We will cast out the communists, Marxists, and fascists. And we will throw off the sick political class that hates our country. He plans to do this in part through what's been called Schedule F, a plan that Project 2025 appears to adopt as well. In the waning days of Trump's presidency, he passed an executive order called Creating Schedule F in the Accepted Service. This order removed employment protections from career officials, those who work in government agencies in a non-political, non-appointed position, deeming them Schedule F employees who may be fired at will by the president, presumably if they don't show sufficient loyalty or execute the duties of the agency in the way the president deems necessary effectively stripping any sort of checks or balances on the president's ability to control federal agencies from the top down. In fact, two former Trump White House aides, Johnny McKenty and Russell Vaught, who were instrumental to Schedule F, are also involved in Project 2025, indicating a continuation of the policy by whatever conservative president next takes the White House. McKenty is quoted as saying, our current executive branch was conceived of by liberals for the purpose of promulgating liberal policies. There is no way to make the existing structure function in a conservative manner. It's not enough to get the personnel right. What's necessary is a complete system overhaul. And that is at the heart of Project 2025's plan. None of their policies and wedge issues work without gutting the administrative states and concentrating more power in the hands of the president. Of course, their goal is also to pack Congress and the courts with as many conservatives as possible, but that's less of a problem when you establish an executive with unchecked power. And through that unchecked power, the new conservative executive will be able to gut agencies and put people in place to further conservative agendas. Those include a push away from environmental protections in favor of becoming a fossil fuels industry leader, a move away from what they call globalism, including encouraging corporations to bring jobs back from overseas, and the foreword to the manifesto declares, those who run our so-called American corporations have bent to the will of the woke agenda and care more for their foreign investors and organizations than their American workers and customers. Today, nearly every top tier US university president or Wall Street hedge fund manager has more in common with a socialist European head of state than with the parents at a high school football game in Waco, Texas. Many elites' entire identity, it seems, is wrapped up in their sense of superiority over those people. But under our constitution, they are the mere equals of the workers who shower after work instead of before. And while that passage is absolutely unhinged for many reasons, there are a few things we can agree on here. American corporations absolutely do care more for their foreign investors and organizations than their American workers and customers. And yeah, they hide behind woke language like DEI while also being awful for workers, the environment, and equality writ large. But I think conservatives genuinely think that corporations actually believe the DEI bullshit they spew, and that it's not just a way to avoid lawsuits. Like, Come on, guys, I thought you were a little smarter than that. Also, I would wager a bet that the framers of our constitution, largely products of the academy, did not consider themselves equal to laborers who showered after work. 
The policy also shows an outsized obsession with China, another popular conservative talking point, saying that China is a totalitarian enemy of the United States, not a strategic partner or fair competitor, and that America's elites have betrayed the American people. The solution to all of the above problems is not to tinker with this or that government program to replace this or that bureaucrat. These are problems not of technocratic efficiency, but of national sovereignty and constitutional governance. We solve them not by trimming and reshaping the leaves, but by ripping out the trees trees, root and branch. The report goes on to say, illegal immigration should be ended, not mitigated. The border sealed, not reprioritized. Economic engagement with China should be ended, not rethought. Our manufacturing and industrial base should be restored, not allowed to deteriorate further. Confucius Institutes, TikTok, and any other arm of Chinese propaganda and espionage should be outlawed, not merely monitored. Another area of grave concern for Project 2025 is the proliferation of LGBTQ ideas and transgenderism, suggesting draconian measures that many critics are saying would effectively criminalize LGBTQ expression. As the foreword to the manifesto says, the next conservative president must make the institutions of American civil society hard targets for woke culture warriors. This starts with deleting the terms sexual orientation and gender identity, diversity, equity, and inclusion, gender, gender equality, gender gender equity, gender awareness, gender sensitive, abortion, reproductive health, reproductive rights, and any other term used to deprive Americans of their First Amendment rights out of every federal rule, agency regulation, contract, grant, regulation, and piece of legislation that exists. It goes on to say, pornography manifested today in the omnipresent propagation of transgender ideology and sexualization of children has no claim to First Amendment protection. Its purveyors are child predators and misogynistic exploiters of women. Their product is as addictive as any illicit drug and as psychologically destructive as any crime. Pornography should be outlawed the people who produce and distribute it should be imprisoned. Educators and public librarians who purvey it should be classed as registered sex offenders. And telecommunications and technology firms that facilitate its spread should be shuttered. As far as I can tell, to them, pornography includes any discussion of being transgender or really discussion of sexual and gender identity, period, based on their reference to educators and public librarians who've been under attack for allowing children to check out such psychologically destructive books as And Tango Makes Three, a book about gay penguins and Sparkle Boy, a book about a little kid who wears a tutu. But the rape and murder in the Bible is fine and definitely requires zero therapy later in life. A later chapter in the manifesto on the Department of Health and Human Services advocates that the president should direct agencies to rescind regulations interpreting sex discrimination provisions as prohibiting discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, gender identity, transgender status, sex characteristics, etc. This would strip protections for LGBTQ folks, as well as women, it seems, given that gender identity is listed, effectively making current regulations around sex discrimination fully obsolete. The chapter further states that the next president should require agencies to maintain a biblically-based social science reinforced definition of marriage and family, meaning the next president should push to remove protections for same-sex marriage. And that's not the only reference to the Bible or the sanctity of the family in the policy document. Its 920 pages are littered with references to the Bible and Christianity and the traditional family unit. The foreword declares the most important community in each of our lives and the life of the nation is the family. Today, the American family is in crisis. 40% of all children are born to unmarried mothers, including more than 70% of black children. There is no government program that can replace the hole in a child's soul cut out by the absence of a father. Which, first of all, that's some old school Republican language. The loud welfare queen wolf whistle of Reagan rings on into the night, I see. But also, frankly, as someone without a dad, I I can confirm that actually the health insurance I had through the state as a poor recently graduated 22 year old paid for the therapy that I needed to fill that hole. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. But that's not the point. The point is to demonize single mothers, especially black ones, and place the blame of all of society's woes on the backs of individuals who just need to work harder to maintain their traditional family units, and not on the system that leads to impoverished single mothers in the first place, like, I don't know, the mass incarceration of black fathers, for example. One of the main stated goals of the policy is securing our God-given individual rights to live freely against the woke agenda. The opening note of the manifesto states, today the left is threatening 
threatening the tax-exempt status of churches and charities that reject woke progressivism. They will soon turn to Christian schools and clubs with the same totalitarian intent. In the chapter on COVID-19 policies, the author asks, how much risk mitigation is worth the price of shutting down churches on the holiest day of the Christian calendar and far beyond as happened in 2020? What is the proper balance of lives saved versus souls saved? And the fact that these people think that the federal government should be concerned with saving souls tells you enough about the belief system of the people who want to overrun our government. The chapter on the U.S. Department of Labor states, God ordained the Sabbath as a day of rest, and until very recently, the Judeo-Christian tradition sought to honor that mandate by moral and legal regulation of work on that day, and blames consumerism and secularism for the decline in Sabbath observance, calling on Congress to encourage communal rest by amending the Fair Labor Standards Standards Act to require that workers be paid time and a half for hours worked on the Sabbath. Which sounds kind of nice, except for the whole Christian nationalism thing. The chapter on the U.S. Department of State says that special attention must be paid to challenges of religious freedom, especially the status of Middle Eastern Christians and other religious minorities, as well as the human trafficking endemic to the region. But of course we know which religious freedom they're concerned with here. In all of this, Project 2025 essentially creates a blueprint for the proliferation of a Christian nationalist agenda agenda at every level of government. You guys, that's just one pillar of Project 2025. This 920-page manifesto is pillar number one. But it is the most extensive because it lays out the foundation for everything to come and how the next president should go about pushing every conservative talking point imaginable, all with the backdrop of eviscerating federal agencies and concentrating as much power as possible in the hands of the president. Pillar number two is the creation of a personnel database, what they're calling the conservative LinkedIn, which sounds like hell on earth, from which to pull qualified conservatives to place at every level of government. They have an application to be part of the personnel database linked on their website. So I thought, hell, maybe I'll apply. Y'all are always telling me that I should get involved in government. They even had boxes I could check saying that I'm liberal and progressive, so it seems like maybe I'm welcome too. I just answered a few questions, and they were all interestingly worded as though they were trying to woke bait me, like, the gender wage gap is the result of prejudice and discrimination, agree or disagree. Or, the U.S. needs nationalized health care, agree or disagree. I answered honestly, attached my resume, and submitted. A few minutes later, I received a confirmation email that my application had been received. We'll see what happens next. Seems like a good way to keep abreast of developments. Seems like definitely something that could easily, I don't know, be overrun with liberal and progressive applications. It would really be too bad if like every person who watched this video submitted an application to be added to the database. Seems like it would make their job a lot harder to find the good conservative candidates in all those applications. I mean, that's just like something I was thinking about. I'm just spitballing here, okay? I left the link to the application in the description just so that you can do your own independent research and form your own opinions. The third pillar of Project 2025 is training. According to the Project 2025 website, the Presidential Administration Academy covers topics ranging from how to identify appointee positions for which you qualify, to navigating the necessary background and security clearance processes, to recognizing and addressing the dangers of the administrative state. Potential appointees will learn the intricacies of the federal budget process, how to work with the media, managing congressional and stakeholder relations, the federal procurement process, and dozens of other topics that provide the knowledge and skills, you'll need to be an effective presidential appointee. Current certificate programs offered are called Prepared to Serve, Conservative Governance 101, and Conservative Governance Advancing Policy, with more on the way. It appears that the application to take those courses is the same one to be added to the personnel database. So if you, for some reason, decided to, I don't know, submit an application and overwhelm their personnel database, maybe you would also be given access to these courses. I'm not sure. Definitely do your own research. The final pillar, pillar number four, is the 180-day playbook. This appears to be yet to be written, but according to the website, the playbook would include a comprehensive, concrete transition plan for every single federal agency to implement in the first 180 days. This mirrors the plan that the Heritage Foundation gave to Reagan when he entered office, allowing him to hand off vetted conservative policy initiatives to each agency without having to do much work on his own. The Heritage Foundation, which is the creator of Project 2025, is seeking to redo what they did with Reagan, but put it on steroids. That 920-page manifesto is a good indication of the types of recommendations that they'll give to each agency. Okay, so I hope that I have sufficiently communicated the gravity of this plan. If a Republican wins the presidency in 2024, they will be handed this plan. 
They, of course, aren't required to do anything with it, in theory, but given that Trump and DeSantis, the two frontrunners for the nomination, are both batshit fucking off their damn rockers, it seems likely that whoever wins the nomination would wholeheartedly back most, if not all, of the policy items put forth by Project 2025. Lord knows Trump isn't going to read any of this, so he'll likely just hand it off as is, to be implemented by people who can read good and stuff. So what do we do? We make extra damn fucking sure that the Republican doesn't win the election in 2024. This is an all hands on deck situation, my friends. Do I want Biden? No, but he is once again the best choice that we have. You also need to vote in Democratic senators and representatives as well. You need to bring your roommates and your partners and your family members and make sure that they vote. You need to call them ahead of time and be like, hi, what's your plan for voting? You need to be thinking about this early and often. Often. You need to be just a little bit scared. Not to be fear-mongery, but this is genuinely a terrifying prospect for our government that feels really, really imminent. Of course, any of these unilateral actions that a Republican president could theoretically take could then also be challenged in courts, but he's packed the courts, including the Supreme Court, and the result of attempting to implement all of these new policies in the first 180 days would be sheer chaos. John F. Kelly, Trump's literal chief of staff, has said it would be chaotic. It just simply would be chaotic because he'd continually be trying to exceed his authority, but the sycophants would go along with it. It would be a nonstop gunfight with the Congress and the courts. Even if the theoretical Republican president couldn't get through all of these policy proposals, it would still create a level of chaos that could further undermine trust in the government as a whole. The good news, if you could call it that, is that Project 2025 is radical. It does not comport with how the majority of Americans feel. 71% of Americans support same-sex marriage. 85% of Americans believe abortion should be legal under at least certain circumstances, and only 13% say it should be illegal under all circumstances. 69% of Americans believe that the U.S. should take steps to become carbon neutral by 2050. The number of adults in the U.S. who identify as Christian has fallen by 25% since the 1990s. For most people, Democrats, centrists, and even some Republicans, Project 2025 goes way too far and represents an upheaval and existential threat that is beyond what most people want to see in the U.S. government. So my hope is that the more people who know the actual contents of the Project 2025 plan, the more people will get out and vote to make sure the hellscape it presents never comes to fruition. Sharing this video with your networks is a great place to start. If you liked this video, you might also like my video about why conservatives are obsessed with election fraud. Thank you to my Patreon supporters, including my newest patrons, and an extra special shout out to my multi-platinum patrons, Anthony Giles and Brett Piontek. If you're interested in behind the scenes content, access to my research and show notes, content about my dog, and all sorts of other stuff, consider joining me over on Patreon today. Thanks so much for watching. Have a good day. Bye-bye!